Well, today we're going to be in the antediluvian patriarchs. Isn't that a wonderful term? We're going to be in Genesis chapter 4 and 5. It really talks about, uh, seems to be, the development of the children of the evil one, exemplified in Cain, chapter 4, and the development of the godly line, children of God, uh, typified in Seth. And we're going to see the development of that. Uh, that's kind of a, a strong way of putting it because in chapter 6, everybody's evil and everybody's destroyed but Noah. And so that is maybe an over-simplification of the truth. But that seemed to be the major breakdown. Let's begin in chapter 4 then if we could. Now the question is, do these uh, uh, people overlap? Can you really go back to 4000 B.C. for a beginning? Martin Luther says yes. One of my favorite commentators, Loophole, says yes. I just don't think so. There's, there's bound to be some gaps in here. I don't think Adam was alive through most of these patriarchs' life, uh, antediluvian patriarchs. Um, I just think there's some folks left out. This is kind of a summary statement, hitting the high point, so characteristic of Old Testament Hebrew genealogies, and so we can't base date on this at all. Now, the man had relations with his wife. It's the word new. And basically, it is very helpful for us to realize the word no in the New Testament with this Hebrew background means intimate personal relationship, for that is the basis of biblical faith. Here, Adam knew Eve and she conceived, and that's the idea here. So, uh, the word no speaks of personal relationship. Here, sexual, which is the most intimate that man knows. With his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. There's a play on the word Cain, and, the, and she said, I have gotten a man-child. The word gotten and the word Cain are very close together. It is not a scientific, philological etymology, but it is a popular etymology based on sounds that is so characteristic of Genesis. Matter of fact, these uh, popular etymologies appear in the so-called J uh, and D and P and all these different uh, sources that higher criticism says are here, which tells me there's just one and I personally believe the authorship of Moses, using possibly oral traditions, some written traditions, as we'll see from the beginning of chapter 5, uh, and certainly revelation from God. Uh, I have gotten a man-child. This is the only place that a child's name is this particular Hebrew word for man. So I think it's not a male here, but a man-child is a very good translation. And then it says, my New American Standard says, with the help in italics of the Lord. But the inference here seems to be that God has given him a child. It's an obvious allusion back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Maybe Eve thought this was the promised one that God mentioned. Maybe she's saying, I have begotten a child, as God said she would. Whatever the illusion is, it's obviously back to chapter 3. And Eve, this is her statement of faith uh, in this uh, understanding of birth. Uh, and again, she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now, the rabbis say, because it doesn't say Adam knew Eve, that that means that Abel is Cain's twin brother. But we can't read that in the text, and that's just supposition. Now, the word Abel seems to come from the Hebrew word vanity or nothingness. You might well see Ecclesiastes 1-2. Some say it comes from Akkadian for son. Uh, some say she had such great hopes in Cain, but that dwindled when Cain seemed to live up to be more evil, and that this was a, her later son. She named the sense of the discouragement she felt at man's current condition. There's going to be a million interpretations of all these different little detail points, none of which can be backed up from the text. They're all supposition based on the bias of the commentator. I'll give you several of them to show you. The etymologies through here, uh, we have really no idea how to lock these down because we don't know what Adam and Eve spoke, what language. It obviously wasn't Hebrew. We don't know what it was. Now, Notice, and Abel was a keeper of flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. This is not the traditional uh, antagonism between farmer versus uh, cattleman. That's not what it's talking about. The boys had two different interests, and their life developed around two different lifestyles. That's what it's talking about. Now, um, let's see. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Notice here. Uh, that Cain is the first one to bring the offering. Not Abel, but Cain. Now, it seems to be just a matter-of-fact way of saying this. It doesn't seem to be the institution of sacrifice. It simply probably means as a regular uh, part of their habit. Probably yearly they did this, and this describes one of what happened at one of the years. Now, brought an offering to the Lord. Um, let's see. 
Do you think they came back to the front of the Garden of Eden to do that, where the cherubim and the flame and, and the sword that turned both ways was? You think that's where they met God? It doesn't say they had built an altar here. Maybe they went right back to where they saw a visual representation of his presence in the cherubim. Maybe that's where they went. I think it's possible. Uh, verse 4, Then Abel on his part also brought of the firstlings of the flock. Now many have said this firstling is the key to the, to the reason why Abel's is accepted and Cain's isn't. I don't think it has anything to do with Abel's as a bloody sacrifice and Cain is a vegetable sacrifice. Vegetable offerings are part of the Mosaic offering and seem to be uh, accepted by God throughout uh, the Pentateuch. So, I don't think that's the idea here. But it seems that Cain brought just some of his crops, but Abel brought the best of his flock. And there was an attitude of faith behind Abel's and an attitude simply of ritual behind Cain's. You say, where do you get that from? Well, I think it's clearly seen in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5, and possibly in 1 John chapter 3, I believe it's verse 12. Uh, yeah, verse 12 of 1 John 3. And you can see the difference the New Testament authors put on the attitude, not the sacrifice. And notice it says, uh, the flock and of their fat portions. It meant the fat of the entrails, and that later became what was offered on the altar. The priest got some, sometimes the, the offerer got some, sometimes it was all burnt, but always it was the fat on the entrails. And the Lord regarded, uh, had regard for Abel and his offering. Now the Hebrew here is looked upon. There has been all kinds of speculation what this meant. Some said God sent fire from heaven to consume one and didn't consume the other. Some said God turned his back on one. We have no idea how it was. Some say, well, Abel's flock prospered, but, but Cain's vegetables didn't. We have no idea at all. But it was obviously communicated some way. And notice, the person of Abel is accepted before his gift. That's always been God's way. The heart always comes before the gift. God always sees the heart first. And that this seems to fall right in line with that. You might want well to see Hebrews 11.4 here for the ideal of faith on Abel's part. Now, but for Cain and his offering, uh, God had no regard. So Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. Now the context here is worship. And Cain, the, the intensity of these Greek words, he threw a temper tantrum at God and he's going to take it out on his brother. Wow. Well, we can see sin developing here so clearly. Then the Lord God said to Cain, God's going to take special time to try to talk Cain out of this. Uh, why are you so angry? And why is your countenance fail? This is questions, not so much for God's knowledge, but to bring man to a state of knowledge. Um, if you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for you, but you must master it. Man, some commentators say this is the most difficult verse in all of Genesis. It seems to me it's obvious what we have here. God is warning Cain that sin is developing in his life. He's also telling Cain if he'll resist it, him and God can overcome it. But if he won't, sin is going to take Cain's life in a real sense. That's the idea of sin is crouching at the door. Now some say as a wild animal to attack him. And that may be true. Now we'll see 1 Peter 5, 8 where Satan is depicted that way. Others say the word crouching comes from an Akkadian word to describe the demonic. And maybe that's the ideal here. Notice its desire is for you. It wants you. This sin personified wants you to destroy you. It's the same word used back in chapter 3 verse 16 for Eve's desire for her husband. But it, you can master it. Now that's helpful. It shows there is an idea that we can resist the devil. Now I think that's so important. This idea of resisting the devil can be seen in Ephesians 6, 13, James 4, 7, and 1 Peter 5, 9. We can resist the devil with great blessings to follow. Now, notice where it says in verse 8, uh, And Cain told his brother, now, some translations say Cain told his brother what God had said, implication being he tricked his brother by false motives to get him out in the field to kill him. Other translations, like the RSV, follow several ancient translations, like the Samaritan Pentateuch, the Septuagint, the Syriac, and the Vulgate, that, that talks about him being lured into the field. And that seems to be the inference here. It's premeditated murder of his brother with his anger toward God, which makes it so much worse and so much more evil. And it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. 
There's no, tempta no tempter here. Chapter 3 talked about the tempter, the supernatural tempter. But here it's just full-blown sin nature running its course. And he killed his brother. You might want to see 1 John 3, 12, where Cain's called the child of the evil one. Wow. And of course, Abel, because of his faith sacrifice, is seen to be a child of God. The, the intensity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent is already starting. Look at verse 9. And God said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's shepherd? Oh. Now, God knew what happened. He wanted Cain to admit it. But we don't see any repentance here. We see hard-hearted, unrepentant. Now, he's going to be sorry for the consequences of his sin and say, oh, this is too hard. But he's not sorry for the sin. He's not sorry he killed his brother. Never apologizes. Never a word is recorded about saying anything to his parents or to God. No, no. Hard-hearted sin. And God said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Now, of course, the Hebrew thought is that life is in the blood, Leviticus 17, 11. And so the life was calling, some say for vengeance, some say because it, it, it didn't get to run its course. Uh, we see the same allusion in Genesis 6, 9, and 10. The word blood is plurals. Rashi, uh, Jewish commentator, says that means that Cain's blood and the blood of his descendants that would have been cries from the ground. But there are many plurals in Hebrew, and so I, I think that's reading way too much into it. And now you are cursed from the ground. Now the word cursed here is the same word used earlier. Earlier it wasn't man that was cursed. Now the serpent was cursed and the ground was cursed but not man. Here man is cursed. Oh my goodness. From the ground. Now Cain's a farmer and here he's going to be cut off from that whole lifestyle. The earth won't bring forth even its limited produce to him now which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood. The, the blood polluted uh, that which he made his livelihood from. You, uh, when you cultivate the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. Now many have said this is why he became, uh, if you will, a builder of a civilization. He became an urbanizer, whereas before he was a ruralist. And maybe because he couldn't be a ruralist anymore, that there was no agricultural crops that would, would yield for him. He became a wanderer. And, of course, the word wanderer is a play on the word nod down in verse 16, which means wandering. So he became a vagabond and a wanderer. And Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is too great to bear. No sorrow, no sorrow over the act, just sorrow over the consequences. Behold, verse 14, Thou hast driven me this day from the face of the ground. The idea he can't be a farmer anymore. And from thy face I shall be hidden. He realized that spiritual death uh, ultimate had occurred. He felt estranged from God. Maybe there was a sense he was going to be driven away from the entrance to the Garden of Eden. Maybe they held on to God's presence by being close to where they knew he was. But Cain was going to have to leave and, and wander around. Maybe that's the idea here. Um, and I shall be a vagabond and a wanderer on the earth. And it will come about whoever finds me kills me. Now some say this, this implies that uh, uh, Cain thought there were other people living around. Rashi says it was meant for the animals, that the animals wouldn't, or, were, would kill him. But I think it's obviously people, and I think it's the idea here. We don't know how many children existed by this time. And obviously the children would be mad because of what Cain did to Abel. And maybe it's the sense of the Goel, a kinsman, redeemer, or avenger. His own family he was afraid of because they might kill him. So the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. That's complete vengeance. Now, Rashi says this means that Cain's uh, judgment is going to be put off seven generations and that Lamech is going to kill him. We'll see that later in this chapter. That's a rabbinical argument and, and legend that's not really valid. Uh, and the Lord appointed a sign for Cain, lest anyone find him should slay him. This sign seems to be, the rabbis say that, that God put a horn in his forehead, but I think that's too much. Uh, it seems to be some kind of mark, maybe a mark uh, like the um, phylactery, Deuteronomy 6, 8. Probably more like the mark on the forehead we see in Ezekiel 9, 4, and 6, where we just can't be certain. It was a sign of two things. Some say it's a sign of God's mercy that no one would kill him. Others say it was a sign of God's judgment that he would live out his sentence and would warn everybody else of breaking God's law. I'm not sure which of those it is. Um, then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. I think he uh, left um, the area of Eden. Or it may be a spiritual sense of left comp any possibility of fellowship with God. And set on the land of Nod, east of Eden, the same way Adam and Eve were banished, he went further out that way, and the word means wanderings. 
Um, now in verses 16 through 24, we see that banished man starts a world system. And I think that's exactly what it is. This world system is between the, the kingdom of, of the evil one and the kingdom of our Christ. We see it in the book of Daniel how those kingdoms become progressively anti-God. We see it finally typified in the whore of Babylon, the book of Revelation, an anti-God system. And here we have it here. It's the Johannine use of the word world, human society organized and functioning apart from God. Now notice that he had relations with his wife, apparently his sister, uh, probably married before that he killed Abel, and gave birth to Enoch. Now the list of names here of the seed of Cain is very similar to the list of names of the seed of Seth. There is some connection. Maybe the two groups of families uh, uh, you know, saw each other. Maybe the names were limited, but they're very close. Not exact, but very close. And he built a city. Maybe here. It's really the idea he was building because he was still couldn't stay in one place. Maybe the building of a city is he's trying to defy God's will about making him move around. Or maybe it's the idea of building a fort so no one will kill him. Whatever, we're not sure. Um, now to Enoch was born Irad, and to Irad became the father of Mehujal. Now there's many names through here with a thousand possibilities. I've put them in your outline so you can see what men think they are, but the truth is when great scholars disagree like you're going to see in your notes, it means we have no idea what these names are, but they're very similar to names that will come later. Um, now here we have Lamech, and Lamech took for himself two wives. Verse 19, first polemist, and he comes in the sinful line. Now some say he took two wives. Rabbis say the, that this period they had two wives. One that was to bear children and one that was really pretty just to play around with. I don't know about that. They get it from these two names of these girls. The first one, they say, means ornament or mourning. And the second one means shadow or shade, which means one was very prominent and the other was just back in the background. Maybe that's true. We just can't be certain. Um, let's see. And Adah gave birth to Jabal, and this means wanderer. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. And his brother's name was Jubal. That means sound. We're not certain. And he was the father of all those who play the string instruments and the wind instruments. Now, Satan is called the inventor of music in Ezekiel 28, uh, th 13. So here's something good that gets perverted. Notice all these trades and smiths begin in the evil line which shows that those folks have gifts and they tend to build up urbanization or cities. We know that Jericho goes back to 7000 BC, so it's not unusual to find cities so early. And Zeba gave birth to Tubal Cain, which seems to mean smith. Cain may be smith or man who works with his hands. The forger of all the enemies of bronze and irons and his sister of Tubal Cain was Nama. The rabbis say she married Noah, but we're not certain of that at all. Her name means beautiful or pleasant. Then Lamech said to his two wives, this is the first poetry, and boy, it's a humdinger. It's evil as it can be. Some say that he held up a sword that he had made and showed it to his son Tubal, and that's what he's talking about here. Uh, it shows the intensification of, of Cain's seed into evil and revenge and hatred, and it's obvious here. Now, the rabbis say that Lamech killed by accident Cain, that his son Tubal Cain was leading him around. He was blind. They were hunting, and the boy saw Cain, thought he was an animal. His daddy shot it. When he found out what he did, his daddy was clapping his hands together in sorrow and somehow got the boy's head between his hands and killed the boy. And that's why he's, this poetry is directed to the wives because the wives left him over it and he's trying to get them back and explain what happened. Now that is rabbinical legend and I do not think that is valid here. It seems to me it's just an intensification of revenge. Now, um, verse 22 and 23 is related grammatically to 22, which says it's connected with the son Tubal Cain who made weapons. Uh, then Lemic uh, 70 fold. Now, some say that Jesus refers to this in Matthew 18, 21, and 22 about forgiveness, but I'm not really sure about that. It just means very severe. His anger has intensified, his pride has intensified uh, from Cain's. Then Adam had relations with his wife again, and she gave birth to a son and named him. Now notice, sometimes he names him, sometimes she names him. She names him in 425, but he names him in 53. So I guess they just got together. The boy's name seems to be a play on the word appointed or set, which seems to be faith, called that God has done this. Now he has a son named Enosh, which is one of the Hebrew words for man. It's used in the sense of man in his frailty or weakness. And the men began to call upon the Lord, Yahweh. You ought to connect this with Exodus 6.3 where it says they didn't know God's name till after Moses. 
Well, apparently they knew God's name, didn't know exactly what it meant till later. And that, that seems to be the truth here. Now, in chapter 5, there are several possibilities about what this chapter means. As 4 is the development of, of the seed of the evil one through Cain, and we hear nothing more about them after 4. Some say it's the development of the godly line up to Noah. Some say it's death's onslaught, and he died, and he died, and he died. Some say it's God's hope chapter in the sense of Enoch over here in verses 31 through 34. Some say it's the children of God versus the children of the evil one. That may be true. And some say chapter 6 shows the whole group was as evil as they could be, and God had to destroy them. And so that puts a perspective on even the godly line was pretty corrupt by this time. This is the book of the generations of Adam. Now that tells me there was a book that apparently Moses used. Uh, I think Moses used written sources. I believe he used oral sources. I believe he had direct revelation, all three of those. I believe uh, Ezra edited the whole Pentateuch, uh, finally. In the day that God created man, he made him in God's likeness. Now he and God in the same sentence seems to imply two different people. Maybe the idea of the pre-incarnate Christ made them in God's image. That's a New Testament truth. We see the plural in 126, 322, and 117. Maybe that's the idea here. We just can't be sure. The very fact he mentions that he created them in male and female, created he them in the likeness of God, it shows that we're, we're copy out of a book that goes back and picks up some of the earlier things that have been incorporated in the Bible in chapter 3. Notice it says, uh, man in the day when they were created. Here's the word day in verse 2, used in a non-24-hour sense, much like it's used in chapter 2, verse 4, at Psalms 90, verse 4, which means yom does not always mean a 24-hour day. It can mean a period of time. Now, notice what it says in verse 3, according to his own likeness, according to his image. Now, here is the boy coming in, the, in Adam's image i.e., not God's image. That's one interpretation. But the other interpretation is that, that God's image is still in man even though man is fallen. And I'm not real sure which it is. Um, okay. Notice it mentions a, a, a group of people down through here. A lot of uh, exaggerated ages. Some say it's not a literal year. Some say it means tribal groups. Uh, some say sin hadn't pervaded humankind yet. I tend to take number three, that sin hadn't really pervaded humankind, that uh, I don't know what else to do with it. Uh, I don't think it's similar to the Babylonian kings list. It has thousands of years for kings. I just think these guys lived longer before the flood. By that or not. Uh, the names of these are in your outlines. We're not sure of the etymology, but they're in your outlines. Notice we come down to Enoch, which is so uh, beautiful because it says he walked with God. Now, what does that mean, he walked with God? Well, it's a hithphel in the Hebrew, which seems to intimate intimate fellowship with. And maybe that's the idea here. You might want to see Malachi 2.6 and Genesis 3.8 for the same idea of walking with God. For God, man being afraid of God when he heard him walking in the cool of the garden implies that God walked with man every day and met him there. And that seemingly this fellowship happened uh, with Enoch. Does that mean that Enoch went back into the Garden of Eden or Enoch went back to, went to heaven? We don't know. It's just that God took him. And this very same verb, God took him, is used for Elijah in 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 3, 5, 9, and 10 when God took Elijah. So there's two of them death missed. There's hope, friends. It's kind of a promise that death wouldn't get us all. It's a foreshadowing of the ultimate that's going to happen to all of us who know Christ. Boy, I think it's beautiful here. Um, some say it's figurative, not literal, and they get that from Genesis 17.1, Deuteronomy 13.5, Ephesians 4.1, 5.2, 5, 5.15, and 1 John 1.7. And it's certainly true. It is a metaphor, and it may be a metaphor here. Now, notice it says, uh, let me go on a little bit further. Um, notice it has Lamech here, has Enoch here. That's very similar to the other names. Why these names are very similar, we just don't know, but they are. Now we come very rapidly through these genealogical lists, which I don't think are complete, are overlapping, but representative, to verse 28 where Lamech is going to have a son. He's going to call him Noah. Now Noah means rest, but he's going to say, this one shall give us rest from the work and from the toil of our hands arising from the ground which the Lord cursed. This is an obvious allusion back to the curse of Genesis 3.17. Uh, somehow this man saw Noah as being a hope to get out of the curse that God put on the ground. And Noah was a special person, and Noah brought a, 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 a redefined covenant. Now, he's not the Messiah, but he's certainly a godly man. The only two people in the Bible that said they walked after God is Enoch and Noah.
And so he is a godly man, and his father's faith can be clearly seen. We've seen Adam's faith. We've seen Eve's faith. We've seen Abel's faith. We've seen Seth's faith. We've seen Enoch's faith. Now we see Lamech's faith, and we're going to see Noah's faith. Do you see how even in the midst of sin, God's uh, people are growing? There are some strong lovers and followers of God. That's the hope here, and it's developing. Now, we mention a threefold children in verse 32 that Noah's going to have three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. We're not real sure they're in the order of birth or why they're in the order. M many people think that Shem means renown or name, and people think Ham means to be hot or to be burnt, and some think Japheth means beauty or spreading out. Now, again, we're not certain. There's a million possible etymologies because these are not original Hebrew words, and so we just can't be sure. But that's the end. Next time we're going to get into Noah and uh, what he did with God. But do you see, do you see the, the development of the two seeds? The children of the evil one in open defiance against God and the children of God. Now they're still sinful and they're still going to be judged, their families, but there's, there's a love there. There's a fellowship there. Friends, this, these two developing is what Augustine called the two cities. Uh, the kingdom of the evil one, that's the world system. We live in the kingdom of the evil one right now, even though we know Christ. The world system is fallen. The world system is anti-God. The world system is humanistic. Oh, but God's seed is developing and maturing, and it's going to overcome. Oh, hallelujah. The seed of the serpent is doomed, and the seed of the woman is going to be lifted up and glorified. I've enjoyed being with you. I'll see you next week. God bless you.